will be on the screen. Now, the pastor's messages have been about the birds. This is for the birds, so your songs are going to be about the birds. And this one's flying away. Some glad morning when this life is o'er I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory I'll fly away When I die, hallelujah, by and by song for you is under his wing where we want to be all the time yes sir maybe staying with the bird theme his eye is on the sparrow why 
why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven's home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled. I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, Songs give place to sighing when hope within me dies. I draw the closer to him from care. I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Very good. You may be seated. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, church family. Thank you for being here. If you're visiting with us today here at Canyon Springs, we want to just kind of welcome you to our family, and we trust that you feel welcome already. And uh, we're just so glad to have you this morning. What's going on in the life and ministry here? Uh, Canyon Springs got several things. We've got our annual family business meeting tonight right after the evening service. Evening service starts at 6 o'clock. And then so right after that, it'll only be a few minutes. And uh, if you have any questions about that, I will be available after service today and before service tonight. And so please see me if you have any questions about that information that was given to you in the last several weeks. We want to make sure we are accountable for all those types of things. Uh, we've also got, <clears throat> as we're looking forward in the calendar just a little bit, uh, we're going to have on Valentine's Day, we're going to have all-day concert there in the morning and in the evening uh, with evangelist, music evangelist Mark Gray. 
and it's going to be great. He was here with us last year and had a great, great concert, and I know that that will be a blessing uh, to you folks um, as you kind of uh, uh, maybe uh, navigate different kinds of things that you can be involved in uh, this year, and I think gospel music is one of those things that will uplift you rather than tear you down, uplift you rather than tear you down. Let me just say before we get into uh, Luke chapter 12, and let me encourage you, if you want, you could go ahead and feel free to start getting over in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter number 12. Um, if you find your way over there, but let me make a mention of a couple things. Uh, feel free to uh, silence your cell phone this morning if you want. Um, I, I, I'm making a good... Uh, I. I we're, we're trying not to embarrass people, but now we're at the place where we're going to embarrass you because we want you to learn, right? Or something like that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, if you want to go ahead and do that, if it's not already done, Brother Panky, uh, he, he, he doesn't want to have to remember, so he just leaves his phone at home uh, so that he doesn't ever get in a situation to where it would go off at the inappropriate time. Uh, who says you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? And uh, Brother Panky learned something. We were at a funeral, uh, and I was preaching a funeral, and uh, we were, you know, breathing, and people were, you know, and uh, as I was reading the scripture, I hear a old car horn, Aruga. Have you ever heard those? Aruga, Aruga. And it just went off, and it went off, and, and I thought to myself, what jerk would drive up to a funeral? And honk his horn as he pulls up, because I, th I thought he was coming from outside. No, but Brother Panky got up out of his seat and kind of went in the back and kind of <laughs> left. So I think we, we learned our lesson. There's an appropriate time, right, and an inappropriate time. And so if you would like to do that, that would be great. Um, if you, many of you, most of you, uh, do a wonderful job at giving to, to Canyon Springs Baptist Church. There's an offering box in the foyer there, feel free to give on the way in or on the way out or other times. Many of you use your online banking, your bill pay, and you put the church's name and the address there, and that gets right where it needs to go. Many of you, some of you, uh, use Zelly and PayPal, and you can give that at canyonspringsgiving at gmail.com. If you use that address, it gets right where it needs to go. And many of you have done a wonderful job at supplying and taking care of your church family. And uh, our church, we are truly blessed. And thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your faithfulness. Um, I'm, I'm a blessed preacher, and I'm blessed by our people. I'm very thankful for all of that. Wasn't that a wonderful song that we sang, His Eye is on the Sparrow? Uh, it's a great, great song. In fact, it was written by uh, Sevilla Martin. She was the wife of a Baptist pastor, uh, and this was in the spring of 1905. Uh, she tells in her uh, memoirs about how she came up with that song and how she wrote that song. And she says that her and her husband were in New York and they uh, contracted a deep friendship with a couple by the name of Mr. and Mrs. Doolittle. They were true saints of God. Mrs. Doolittle had been bedridden for over 20 years and her husband uh, was a uh, incurable cripple who had to propel himself to and from his business in a wheelchair. Despite their afflictions, they lived a very happy Christian life. Uh, even though they were, uh, you know, and what they did was they brought inspiration and comfort to all of those that knew them. One day, while we were visiting with the Doolittles, my husband, this is what she said, commented, on their bright hopefulness and asked them the secret of their joy in the midst of pain. Mrs. Doolittle's reply was simple. If his eye is on the sparrow, then I know he watches me. The beauty of this expression of simple faith gripped my heart and at the same evening I wrote the words for the song. And she says, the rest, as, it is, as they say, is history. But if God sees the sparrow, why wouldn't he be able 
to see me also. Life is that way sometimes. And we've been uh, journeying together this new year on new beginnings. And we've started recently a series of things that were uh, for the birds. We've been taking these passages that mention birds and we've been applying them to our life. And, and I think we were learning a lot as we learned the other night about the fowler and the snare of the fowler and, and how that the bird gets snared and how he gets set free when the snare is broken and the fowler is defeated. This morning, as we look at our passage, I want to mention to you another bird, but let's look at verse number four, and uh, we will get some context here, but let's read verses four, five, six, and seven. And then we'll go back for some context. And I think it'll be a blessing to you this morning. And my heart's desire is that as we have a good crowd here today, uh, I'm very thankful for that. Uh, The sun is not shining. And uh, I'm always, usually am able to say, well, the sun is still shining, right? But today it's raining. And that's a blessing too. We need the rain. I sure do like the wildflowers when they bloom. Um, I, I like, uh, not the weeds that are growing in my yard tomorrow, right? That's how that works. But, um, but I am thankful for the rain. I'm thankful for God providing that and blessing us with that, as we haven't had very much recently. Um, several have commented to me that they've lost a few plants and a few trees this past year and a half, and, and I can identify with that. I lost one, too, from the drought last year. And these things just happen, and, uh, but we're glad for the day, and I'm glad for you being here today, and uh, our family really wants to let you know that you are a blessing to us. Luke chapter number 12, verse number 4, Jesus says, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. If you notice in verse 4, Jesus says to his friends, be not afraid. Notice that, be not afraid, okay? Verse number 5 says, but I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. Here's that phrase, fear not. Fear not, therefore. Ye are more value than many sparrows. You are more value than many sparrows. Let's ask God just to kind of help us this morning. I want to talk to you on the subject of, as we're thinking about things that are for the birds, and you understand when I say that, that's, that's something, that's a phrase that uh, comes to know that, you know what, this is something I don't like, uh, that is something I don't want, that is something undesirable, it's unlovely, uh, it's something that is meant for other things lesser than us. And we would say, this is an uncomfortable time. This is for the birds. I don't enjoy this. I, I'm not re- relishing in this. I'm, I'm actually discouraged by it. So we say things like that. I've said it often. You know, this, uh, you know, this you know, sunshine all the year is not for the birds. It's good stuff. But some would say, uh, if you're from Washington like I am, you would say, the clouds and the constant rain and the constant cloudiness, and uh, that's for the birds. And so we're here. It's raining today. Well, maybe not. Maybe the sun's coming through. I don't know, but that's kind of how it happens. But the subject this morning is fear. And I want to submit to you that fear is for the birds. It's just for the birds. There's nothing good about it. Nothing good about it. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we pray that today as we look at this subject of fear, 
I pray, Lord, that you'd help us. Help me communicate your word. Help us to grab a spiritual principle to take home with us. Help us to leave this room, this congregation, this church here with a sense of trust, a sense of power, and a sense of joy. Help us, Lord Jesus, this morning, and we thank you for our friends and our family, Lord, and there's just so many wonderful new faces. I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to connect with new folks. Thank you for that. Bless them, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Luke chapter number 12 here. And the subject, of course, is fear. It's for the birds. It's something that we all have to deal with from time to time. But let's get back to the context of what Jesus was saying. Who was he saying this to? Who was he referring to? What was maybe going on around the time that Jesus was saying these things? And in order to do that, we have to understand where Jesus, uh, what happened in the past. And according to what verse 37 of chapter Number 11 kind of gives us a little insight to this. It says, And as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him, and he went in and he sat down to meet. And so this was a dinner with a Pharisee. Jesus is beginning to have a dinner with the Pharisee. They're gathering together in a home, sitting down, getting ready to eat. And dinner conversation, how many of you are great at dinner conversation? Some of you are good at dinner. That's it, right? <laughs> Maybe not the conversation. But Jesus is there, and of course, Jesus sat down with this Pharisee. And it's interesting, if you were to read and kind of study the rest of that passage in chapter 11, uh, he's not pulling any punches. He's not holding back. In verse 40, he calls them fools. He fools. Now, let me encourage you, if you want to have a good meal with someone, let's not start off with, you fool. <laughs> you know, let's build up to that, right? You know, But Jesus was holding nothing back. In verse 40, woe unto you, and he named Pharisees. Woe unto you, Pharisees. Verse 43, Pharisees. Verse 44 of chapter 11, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees. And then he says, hypocrites. So he just lumped a bunch of people in together in the same group, right? You've heard the phrase, the birds of a feather flock together, right? And so here Jesus says, okay, scribes and Pharisees, and guess what, you hypocrites, because you're all the same. Think about that. So this is what's going on at this meal time. And they were asking things. And then uh, there's more. Verse 45, there's some lawyer there. In verse 46, he says, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers. You're not getting out. I mean, he is going on and on and on and rebuking and rejoicing uh, and telling the truth to all of these different individuals. Verse 52, Woe unto you lawyers. You've taken the key of knowledge, ye entered not into yourselves, and them that is entering in, ye hindered. And so they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Now notice with me the context here of what's happening in verse chapter 12. Let's learn a little bit about that from the end of chapter 11. Look at verse 53 of chapter 11. And as he said these things unto them, so they're at dinner with the Pharisee, the scribes and the Pharisees began to, notice this phrase, Urge him vehemently. I mean, this is, uh, this is one of those dinner parties that doesn't go very well. This is where you've offended the guest. And Jesus was telling the truth, and they were urging him angrily, had anger and indignation in their heart, and they began, if you will, notice, to provoke him, to speak of many things. Verse 54, we get an insight maybe to what was going on on the inside. Laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth. 
that they might what? Accuse him. And so as Jesus went to this Pharisee and had a meal with the Pharisees and he told the truth about their lives, basically they were living lives of hypocrites. Folks, if you will, that uh, look one way on the outside, but on the inside, they were quite different. And because of that, they got angry, and they began to accuse, and they began to do all of those kinds of things. They began to bring accusations. They were looking for him. And that's all from their anger that we saw in verse 53. Now, let's get to chapter 12 now. The Bible says, In the meantime, when they were gathered together, notice, an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another. And he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And so, in the meantime, I don't know if it's after the dinner party or right then at that very moment, but people were coming around and they were gathering around him. And the Bible says that you couldn't even number them. They were all there. Insomuch that they trod one upon another. I mean, really. I mean, this was so packed. I mean, I tell you what, where Jesus was, everybody wanted to see and ask and get to know and wondering what's going on and listen to what he's saying. And some because they wanted to hear from Jesus, some because they wanted to accuse Jesus, and some because they wanted to hurt Jesus. That was in the crowd. It's interesting that it says they trod one upon another. I mean, they were almost walking on each other. They were almost shoulder to shoulder, and they were just all right there. And Jesus begins to say something to them that they needed to hear. Now, keep in mind, this was before COVID, okay? But still, they still had masks on, so they're okay. (laughs) What kind of mask did they have on, preacher? The mask of hypocrisy. I mean, they looked good, acted good. They were the religious leaders, the political leaders. They were the movers and the shakers, but Jesus really called them out and said, guess what? You're just hypocrites. What I see on the outside is absolutely something different than what's going on on the inside. And Jesus says, hey, disciples. Now remember, he's, he, 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 people are all around him, wanting to talk to him. And they're shoulder to shoulder. And then he says to his disciples, first of all. So um, I don't know. I, I typically sometimes do this in church. Uh, I do it a lot at home. But I will say things to one person for the benefit of another. Anyone ever done that? I'll say things to Tracy so that all my girls say, well, I ain't doing that. And then I get in trouble with Tracy later, but, you know, I kind of have to weigh the cost on that. But here was Jesus. This crowd was all around, and they were wanting to hear from him, and he was trying to send a message of what truth is. And here we see that he begins to talk and say unto the disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And then he begins to say, Boys, listen, you see what's happening right now? The Pharisees, the lawyers, the doctors, the politicians, everyone else, you know what they want to do? They want to accuse me. They want to catch me in a lie. They want to do all of this. But let me just tell you something about them. They are all hypocrites. And then he says, boys, listen, listen. In verse number two, he says, there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. And so I could see him telling his disciples this and maybe them wondering, uh, what's he talking about, me? 
But I think maybe he was talking about them on a personal level, and then maybe all of the crowd, hey, you guys need to be careful, because guess what? Whatever you're planning in secret is going to be made to light. Verse 3, Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall ye be heard in the light. And that ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And Jesus is saying, boys, listen, what we're hearing from these Pharisees and scribes, guess what? There's a lot of backroom deals, a lot of backroom discussions, a lot of secret things. How am I going to, the Bible talks about often in the Gospels, how they secretly tried to come and figure out ways to get rid of Jesus. And Jesus says, guess what? It's all going to be brought to light. They think that they're doing something in secret, but it will be all brought to light. Now, we can apply that in our own lives in some ways that, listen, if we live the life of a hypocrite long enough and we begin to believe these kinds of lies, guess what? I'm going to tell you, you just won't be able to do it. And it will all come to light. It will unravel before your eyes. You ever seen someone that has a problem with lying? Pretty soon, all the time, every time they lie, they lie about everything. They tell stories, big lies, all, they, all that. And then pretty soon, they can't even remember all the lies that they told. And so when you ask them about something, you see the deer in headlights? And it will all unravel. Then they have to give you another lie. And pretty soon, the liar knows that when you got his number, he goes on to somebody else. But it will unravel. And this hypocrisy, this wearing this mask, saying, I'm okay, but on the inside, I'm full of dead man's bones. On the inside, the outside of my cup, if you will, looks pretty good, but on the inside is full of dead man's bones. Now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a Neanderthal. I'm a savage at times. Because if I want a cup of coffee and there's a little bit of old coffee in my coffee cup, I'll pour it right in there. I didn't wash it. I'm sorry. I wanted that coffee more than I wanted to wash that cup. I got to confess, I do it once in a while. Especially when the girls are behind on their dishes, right, honey? Great girls? <laughs> I just figure, you know what? It'll all mix up and I'll go down the same hatch anyway. It's all good to go, okay? <laughs> but typically, I like a clean dish. And I know that you do. We would know, not necessarily give to someone a dish that was dirty or we wouldn't say, hey, put this great food right on a dirty plate. We wouldn't do that. But oftentimes we live a life of a hypocrite and we go about our business and you know what? The outside might look really, really good, but on the inside it's a dirty cup. And here Jesus says, I want you to know that everything is going to be proclaimed Everything is going to come out. And guess what? You don't need to be afraid of those people that are pressing on you right now. Those people that are, if you will, angrily, angrily coming up against you. Uh, you don't have to worry. You don't have to be fearful of these types of things. And notice he says to his disciples, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. Be not afraid. I think fears are everywhere, aren't they? I think we've had a good amount of fear over the virus. I think we've had a good amount of fear over the loss of life. I think we've had a good amount of fear about maybe what the future might hold. There's lots of different fears that people have. They're called phobias. You ever heard of that? Phobias. There's the, let me give you 10 of the most common phobias. Arachnophobia. Yeah, some of you that have it know exactly what that is, right? Arachnophobia. Scared of spiders. I mean, you know what? The spider is not even close to you, but you're afraid. They're, they're creepy. 
That's number, that's number one. And then it's uh, Ophiodiophia. That's the fear of snakes. How many like that? I, I don't like snakes. My cousin Jim, he is deathly afraid of snakes. I mean, it's 110 out there, and he's doing yard work in waders. You know what I mean? He's doing yard work in waders. I go, where are you, I'm, are you fishing? No, I'm weeding. You know, because he's just afraid of snakes. He, you know, he's, just, he's afraid. It's a true story, by the way. There's acrophobia. And it's not a fear of circuses and acrobats. It's not. It's the fear of heights. Some say, say 6% of people are, have a fear of heights. Uh, I mean, some people, like, uh, they have a fear of driving on a road that has a steep incline. I mean, they almost just get so fearful or, and so panicked. Aerophobia, that's the fear of flying. Some people have that, fear of flying. One time when I was younger... I got on a plane, and there was a gentleman behind me. He had this fear, I'll tell you that. I mean, he was doing everything. I mean, he was holding on. And I took a little video of him, like, like this, <laughs> behind me, because he's behind me freaking out. I'm like, uh, and, and I enjoyed that for a little while. But, you know, my wife says, you need to delete that. That's not right. <laughs> I said, but it's $10,000. But he was praying. I mean, he was shaking. I mean, he put his hands there, put his hands down. I mean, he was fearful. I mean, every little bump, turbulence, whoo, he would go like that. <laughs> whoo, you know, he's looking around. I mean, he is just, and the whole plane is like, like this. And we could see facial expressions back then because we didn't all wear masks. So, you know, we could see the facial expressions. It was quite the ride, but he was afraid of flying. You'd be surprised what people do. There's a fear of dogs. I don't even want to say what, how it is. I'll probably pronounce it wrong, but it's a fear of dogs. How about that? And uh, I remember we know Joe here is afraid of dogs. Came over to the house one time, and I had a little dog. I mean, I had a little dog this big and she came out and she wanted to get a pet you know she comes out with her tail wagon and I kid you not Joe he was a lot littler back then but he climbed the back of his dad <laughs> I don't know I'm not gonna say this but there might have been a tear or two I'm not sure you could talk to him about that I don't I don't want to say anything about that but I mean, he was deathly afraid of those dogs. That happens. My mother had that. She, did, she got bit by a dog one time, and so every dog, you know, she was not really liking that, those dogs. Astrophobia, that's the fear of thunder and lightning. I mean, when you hear thunder and lightning, you just get a little fearful. You get a little worried. What is that? Uh, I kind of like it. I like going out on the back porch when it's a good old storm, and I really like those things, but some people have that. There's the, the fear of, uh, they call it uh, trypanophia. That's the fear of needles. How many of you got that? You, a lot of people have that, I guess. There's also social phobia. Many have that. It's a social anxiety disorder is what they call it. And where if you get a few people around, somehow I got to be fearful of what's going on, right? And so they get very fearful. Agrophobia. That's a fear of being alone in a situation or being alone in a place where you might not be able to escape. These are the people that uh, don't sit with their back to the door. They sit so they can see the door, right? So they can get out at any moment. Some people have those kinds of fears. Develops into panic. All of that. Number 10 was my Sophia. So my Sophia, I guess it is, is the fear of germs. Well, we could say fear of minute things you can't see. Probably the virus would be one of those, getting sick, all that. 
I mean, you're just fearful of all these kinds of things. And I think, I think one thing that we can recognize is, is that all of us are fearful of some things. I mean, I think it's a very natural thing uh, to be fearful of a few things. I mean, we can't just say, hey, don't fear, and you ought not to have any fear in your life or, or any concept of danger or hot or, you know, that'll burn or anything like that. Jesus often uh, recognized it was a human emotion because when he first saw his disciples, he recognized, what did he say? Fear not, right? He said, peace be, fear not. So Jesus recognized that they were fearful. And as you think about this situation where Jesus, all of these people are all around them, shoulder to shoulder, wanting to hear. And Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. It's hypocrisy. You think about the disciples that were with Jesus that day, kind of shrunk a little bit. I mean, there's a lot of people there. And by the way, if you know your New Testament, you know that stonings were pretty uh, common. Everybody has seen capital punishment in the streets at this time. And they know what it's all about. And it's kind of amazing what can happen if a mob comes through town and gets angry. All sorts of terrible things can happen. And here, Jesus is there, and he begins to tell the disciples, the ones that are there, that are probably fearful of the Pharisees and the religious leaders and the politicians and all the people that are make the city go around, so to speak, and they're so fearful. Now, Jesus just called them out. He said they're being hypocrites. Hey, they're going to be, they're doing something that is not the real you. And by the way, uh, you probably can... Put yourself in their position today. There's lots of people around you. There is lots of opposition to you. There's lots of opportunities for you to be fearful of the future or what they can do to you or what they will do to you or, or all of those kinds of things. But Jesus was telling them, listen, friends, be not afraid. And so I want to listen to the Lord this morning, and, and I'm going to say, listen, I'm not afraid. I'm going to give you three things that we ought not to be afraid of this morning. I'm not, we ought not to be afraid of some things. I'm not afraid, according to what the Bible tells me in verse number four, be not afraid of them that kill the body, that after that have no more than they can do. I am not afraid because the worst thing that any one person can do to me is kill me and that's it. There is an end to what they can do, right? And so if I know what the end is of the, what they can do to me, that's it. Because they can't kill the soul, of course, and they can't do anything but kill me. And so he's telling his disciples, I don't want you to be afraid. We've got people here. And the worst thing that these people could do to you is kill you. Now, that's not a raw, raw statement. I don't think these disciples were liking that at that moment. I thought they heard, what does that mean? That's you, right now, Jesus, or, you know. But I tell you what, I'm not going to be afraid. And here we see there's some levels of fear given to us in verse number four. Notice those that kill the body and then after that can do no more. So we have two different levels. We have the earthly level, the body. And then we also have the eternal level, the soul. And so we've got a couple different levels and we have to choose, hey, am I going to spend all my time being fearful of what the body and the earthly, but recognize something here, friend. If I know the Lord is my Savior and He is mine and I am His, I don't need to fear what anyone might do to me. Let's go to Psalm, Psalm chapter 27. Look what David it's a great psalm. This is one of the psalms that, as a young man, I memorized and uh, put it to heart because 
I didn't want to be fearful of everything in my life. I wanted to be, have power. I wanted to have the freedom to serve God. I wanted to be able to, you know what, listen to the word of God instead of listening to my own fear. I wanted to do this. So Psalm 27 has meant a lot to me. And it's probably very familiar to you. And if it's not, let me encourage you, make it familiar to you. Notice what he says in verse number one. The Lord is my light. Of my salvation, of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumble and fell. Though a host should encamp against me. I mean, can you just imagine everybody pressing in on Jesus and the disciples at that moment? And wanting to know, wanting to hear of an accusation so they could do a dastardly little deed. And David says, listen, I, I, I'm not going to fear. I'm going to trust David says in verse 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Behold, the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. See, what we need to recognize is the very thing that David recognized, that he shouldn't fear what anyone can do to him. It's easier to say than to do, probably. Reality is, friend, when Jesus says, let me tell you something, friends, don't be afraid of them that kill you. You know what you're saying? You see the people that are around you right now, compassed about? Maybe they're like a ravenous pack of wolves, or, or maybe they're like lions hiding in the bush, secretly waiting to pounce on you, or like the fowler setting up a snare for you. You don't need to fear them that kill the body. And we're going to get to the one, a lot of the reasons why, but I'm, I'm just wondering, do you recognize he's saying... You don't need to be fearful of the priest. You don't need to be fearful of the Pharisee, the scribe, the lawyers. You don't need to be uh, uh, the, the, the leaders of the day. You don't need to be fearful of that because all they could do to you is touch the body. But you ought to be concerned more. Look at what our passage says in, in Luke 12. You ought to be concerned more with him that is able to send, it says right here, fear him which hath, after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. So what's he talking about? Who should we fear? Well, of course, we should fear the Lord. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. And so it begins with a honoring, a reverent fear of God. We're not talking about shaking in our boots. We're not talking about, hey, uh, speechless, so to speak. But we're talking about, listen, I don't need to fear the one that can hurt my body. I need to fear the one that has provided for me to live a life of everlasting life with him through what he did for us on the cross. That is who I need to reverence. That is who I need to revere. That's who I need to honor. We spend a lot of time honoring those people that we fear. We focus on them. We focus on our politicians. We focus on our, our problems. We focus on all sorts of things. But why don't we, spend in, in, instead of that, spend a little bit more time on the one that has, if you will, the keys of death and hell and is a decider of heaven and hell and all of that. Let's get our ducks in a row, so to speak. And let's, let's go after holiness. I really think if you would do focus on the Lord and understand that the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, you want wisdom in your life and you go for holiness. 
Why don't we live more holy? You say, well, I am so worried about what's going on. Well, why aren't we being holy? Because we ought to fear him that has power over death, hell, and the grave. We ought to fear him, reverently fear him, of course. Let's not be afraid of any person. No lawyer, no scribe, no government official. Because when it comes right down to it, friend, you and I have a great responsibility to fear the Lord. And look what Peter had to say. Now, Peter was here listening. Peter was here listening to the Lord here in Luke chapter 12. And later in Acts 5, look at the lesson that Peter was able to learn. Look at Acts chapter 5 with me here. Look with me. Acts chapter 5 towards the end of the chapter. Verse 27, and when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest and asked them, they are getting a talking to, saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in his name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and tended to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hung on a tree. Kind of like that uh, dinner with the Pharisee. How did that go? Woe, ye scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. We ought to obey God rather than man. Listen. You and I, there might be a fear of the unknown, of our future, but let me encourage you, what we need to recognize is we are not to fear the one that can kill the body, but we are to fear and honor and reverence the Lord, and as we go about our life, we ought to say, I ought to obey God rather than men. And so guess what? The preaching of God's word, what it says. We, we're going to have to tell the truth. We're going to have to tell the truth about many subjects that the world is, for some reason, did a little fruit basket upset on. They don't understand what truth is. Left is right, right is left, and up and down, and love is one thing. You know what these sickos think? You know what these sickos think? That... They can go around, and as long as they say, I love that person, they can do any wicked thing to them. We've got a bunch of pedophiles running around our country, injuring our innocent children, stealing them, trafficking them, all because they say, I just love the young ones. It's wickedness. And so let's not let the world dictate to us what love is. Amen. Let's not let the world tell us what is right and what is wrong. Amen. Let's let God do that. And when God says, hey, I don't want you to fear. I don't want you to fear because all they can do to you out there is press upon you and give you stress and bring pressure and whatever it might be. But you don't need to fear because that's all they can do tells us we got a higher calling tells us we got to, we, we need to live in a higher plane we are seated in the heavenlies we got to set our affections on things above not on things below we should be able to say listen i'm not afraid i'm not afraid of any person because i have the lord notice what in our text there in luke chapter 12 what else what else should we be saying i'm not afraid about luke chapter 12 helps us Luke chapter number 12, and then notice here verse <clears throat> number 7. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. So what's the Lord telling us when he says, hey, even the hairs on your head are numbered. 
Listen, if God is able, and he is, and if he can number the hairs of your head, now, now I want you to think with me for a second. Um, the scripture tells us right here that the very hairs of your head are numbered. It's not just some blanket statement, yeah, he's got hair. Some of you don't have hair, but some of you got hair, right? All that. It's the very hairs, the singular hair on your head, they have a, they're numbered. That means they have a number. <laughs> and you say, well, I had a number, but they're gone. <laughs> but each hair has a number, and God knows that. And God knows each and every one of us, and he knows exactly how many are on our head. And it just goes to tell us the vastness of God's knowledge, the vastness of his heart, the vastness of his mind and care for us. Because if God can care enough for it to number the very hairs that are on your head, why can't he care? Why, doesn't he under, why don't we understand that if he can care about that, he can care about some of the things going on in our life? He cares about the hair. He numbered him, gave him a number. We're over here fretting. We're over here fearful. We're over here worried because we got some areas in our life. You say, preacher, it's a big area. I understand. But he's over the big areas and the small areas. He cares about them. Look what the psalmist says in 139. Hold your place here. We'll be back. I want you to see this. Psalm 139. David here. Speaks to the Lord about how he knew him. God, how that the Lord knew him, no matter what was going on, no matter how many hairs were on his head, no matter what was happening, you know what? God cared about David. Look with me in verse number one. Oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. I don't even know me. Amen. You know how confused I get? I'm not sure I want that for dinner or that for dinner. I'm, I'm losing my keys. Well, some of you would say, you always lose your keys. That's true. But, but the Lord knows me. And he don't forget. And he knows everything about me. Look at verse, thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Have you ever been driving in a car and you get home and you wonder, I know I drove here, but I don't remember driving here. No, none of you, none of you. Well, you're preoccupied. You got some things going on in your mind. And yeah, you knew you drove there, but at the end of it, you... But guess what? He, the Lord knows your up sittings and your down sittings and where you go and your thoughts that are afar off. He understands that. Look, look with me, verse 17 of this chapter. He says, Thou precious are they thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. So God's thoughts towards us are a great sum, a great multitude. And let me just tell you something. In that crowd, in the crowd that we call America, in the place we call Apache Junction, you might think you're little, you might think you're minute, but understand that the thoughts of God that he has towards you, the sum of those are very great. He thinks about you. He knows you. He knows the hairs on your head. And he knows everything about you. So guess what? I am not going to be fearful. I will not be fearful. I am not going to be afraid uh, of all these things in my life. Why? Because God cares and knows me. And he loves me. And if he cares and loves me and knows how many hairs are on my head, I am just going to trust that he's got these other cares. He's got them all figured out too. I'm not afraid. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke 12. Notice our passage here, verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Interesting, five sparrows. Sparrows are uh, just this little bird. There's millions of them, all different kinds. And, you know, to be honest with you, 
There are a few of the sparrows that are attractive looking, but by all means, most of them are very plain. I mean, very gray and brown and just, you know what, nothing beautiful to look at like maybe, you know, a robin or a blue jay or something like that. Wouldn't catch our eye, but they're just everywhere. They're little birds. And they're not worth very much. We're told here that are not five of them sold for two farthings? What's a farthing? Really, a farthing is really one quarter of a penny kind of thing. It's not even worth a penny. It's just a quarter of it. And that just tells you that these sparrows are not really worth that much. We always kind of believe that, you know, when you go out hunting, you should, if you're going to kill something, you should, you know what? Shouldn't let that meat go to waste. You should, you know, use that. Have you ever killed a bird? Not much meat on them. I mean, you can't even make a chicken nugget. I mean, they're not, they're not worth very much. They're not worth very much. But he says right here, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? Now get this, over there in Matthew it says that two spar- sparrows are one farthing. So here's the idea. How does the math work? Well, if two sparrows are one farthing and five here are f- four, uh, five, exactly, exactly. <laughs> five are sold for two. You know what it means? It means the guy selling the, f- uh, the sparrows is like, ah, uh, I'll give you five for two. Not much. Insignificant, little, un, not of much value. These, these sparrows are one of the things that are everywhere, but nobody even cares. They're, I think they're on most continents, these small sparrows. Nobody at the U.S. government says, you know what, we need to have a commission to see how many sparrows there are. Let's count them. In 1962, they did that with the bald eagle. They figured out that there's about 417 pairs of bald eagles. Now, that's what, what, that's what Google says, okay? Don't, don't, can't trust it, everything, okay? And they said as of today, there's about over 9,700 today pairs. So that's all like, you know, almost 20,000 birds. And so because we count them, because we, we think they're beautiful, we, they have value to the America, they have a value, they're, they're magnificent kind of creatures, that they really are. I remember hearing the, the, the swishes of the air in their wings on the beach where he was standing right there and I got pretty close and then he wanted to go for a ride and he went, and it was like there was power in those wings. It was amazing. But these little sparrows, nothing. They're everywhere. There's a thousand of them. If you want some, they're in my back. Uh, they're in my, my neighbor's trees. <laughs> and they're loud. But guess what? What is the Lord saying to his friends, his disciples here? Don't you know how insignificant sparrows are? But then he says, and not one of them is forgotten before God. Matthew says, not one of them falls to the ground without God knowing. So here's the idea. The idea is, is, you know, a sparrow out there, they're insignificant. Nobody cares about them. They're just doing their thing. By the way, they're not worried. They're happy. They're not concerned where their next meal is. They don't have a, they're not worried. They got it all worked out, okay? Okay. Somehow they got all the phobias worked out. We should learn a little bit from the bird. God takes care of them. And so in the wilderness, in the forest, or in the tree, or in the desert, wherever these sparrows are, wherever we're not, when it falls to the ground, the Bible says that the Lord knows that. There's millions and billions of these things, but God knows every one of them. 
And what is he trying to do to his friends, his disciples here? He's saying, listen, let me tell you something. You don't need to fear that you are ever going to be forgotten in this mess. You don't need to ever fear that somehow you're going through life and somehow God has forgotten you. Because I have it. Because guess what? The insignificant sparrow is sold and they just throw an extra one in. And then guess what? You worry about it. But I know every single one. And that should tell us something about how God feels about us. Amen. In fact, it tells us that we're not forgotten. And he says right there in the end of verse 7, ye are more value than many sparrows. So if God keeps track of the sparrows when they fall, let me ask you this. Are you fearful that somehow God isn't seeing you in your need? Are you fearful that somehow God isn't going to work out all these things according to his purposes? Are you fearful that somehow God has forgotten you in the midst of a wicked and a perverse nation? Are you fearful that somehow, you know what, here I am, I'm living my life, and you know what, now the, the walls are crashing in, they are, the pressure is mounting, and you know what, uh, the, the fear of our life, our livelihood, our way of life is coming in, crashing in, and we're fearful of those things. Jesus said, listen, do you know about the sparrows when they fall? I know it. And guess what? You don't need to fear because you are of more value to the Lord than the sparrows. Listen, let me, I am just not afraid. I am not afraid this morning. I'm not afraid because what's the worst they could do? Kill the body. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt if I were to die today in this pulpit. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt because of what Jesus did for me when he died on the cross for my sins, when he was buried in that tomb, when he rose again victorious and conquered death. And now because I believe in him and I've called upon him to be my Lord and Savior, I know now that in the instantaneous, if I were to depart from this world, my body would be left, but my soul would be with Jesus. Amen. And so what can they do? The problem is, is we've got to, we've learned quite a bit of how to love this thing from the world. It does a great job teaching us these things. It tells us what's beautiful. By the way, what does the Bible say is beautiful? I mean, let me tell you, it's usually not what's on your phone. It's usually not what people are telling you is beautiful. A broken and a contrite spirit to the Lord. A humbleness to God. That's beautiful. We ought to be striving for these things that are biblical rather than worldly or fleshly. We ought to say, man, I, I, I want to make sure that my life is a life where I could say beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm going to be with Jesus and I'm not going to love this thing as much as I've loved it before. I mean, we buffeted this thing. I mean, we, we, we take it to the car wash, hopefully every day, right? Run yourself in the shower, right? Hopefully we do these things. We take care of it. We've learned to love it. But Jesus says, perspective, boys. I'm here right now. And by the way, uh, in verse number one of chapter 12, you remember they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, right? How many want to do that right now today in our climate? What would we be fearful of? The virus. I want to tell you something, and if you listen, it'll help you. Just like the crowd pressing on the disciples in verse number one, how that there was no harm going to be done to the disciples. And here's the reason why. Jesus was with them. And even if they had a virus back then, they had leprosy. Even if they had something, as long as you're with Jesus, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And so guess what? You don't need to fear that. You don't need to fear that. 
If Jesus is with you, guess what? You are going to be okay. Because he sees you, he knows you, and you're more valuable than the sparrows that he knows about. And we need to go out there, fear God, strive to be to his righteousness. I'm glad the Lord doesn't forget about me. I don't know about you, the... Not one of them is forgotten, it says, about the sparrows. Not one of them. Not one. Not one. Not one. Not one. You know, you're that one. You think God maybe forgot about you? you think somehow God didn't, doesn't care about what you're doing in life? Maybe if we recognize that we are valuable to the Lord more than the sparrows, that maybe we would stop acting like the animals that are running around the world today. And maybe we would start saying, you know what, I need to reverence and live in awe and live a holy life that I might be pleasing to the Lord. Because not one of us are forgotten. He knows me, my down sittings and my uprisings. I think at times... We get so off track with priorities. Now, I, I'm, I'm just like you. There's fears and anxieties and worries and all that. I may not be afraid of the spiders like you or the darkness like you. But we all have these fears. But one of the things that we can understand is that when fear comes into your life, it's just for the birds. It's nothing good of it. There, there's nothing profitable that comes in it. And so today I want you to be able to go out there and say, you know what, I'm not going to fear. I'm not going to fear because all they can do is kill me. Can't t- touch my soul, my spiritual life. I, I'm more than what you see. You know, maybe we recognize that our lives would change. Hey, my life is more than just this flesh. I have a spiritual life. I have a relationship with Jesus. If we realize that, maybe we spend a lot less time dealing with our flesh and a lot more time dealing with our spirit. You know what? Some of us are spiritual anemics. We do a great job at feeding our flesh, a very lousy job at feeding our spirit. So we go around life, lopsided. A good balance. Please take care of yourself. Do good to yourself. Be in shape. Do what the doctor says. Take care of it. But boy, Jesus says, don't worry about that body in perspective wise to what is truth. And we need to make sure that we take care of our spirit. So he's saying, guess what? To his disciples, you're far greater than anything And any animals that I've created, birds, you're better than that. And if Jesus was right there with them, they must have felt, hey, I'm better than the the birds out in the field. So God's going to take care of me in the middle of my distress, and I can go around and have no fear. Fear has led to all sorts of things. Panic, fear, phobias. Paralyzing the Christian. Let me encourage you, don't let fear of our country, the direction that it's going, uh, we ought to be concerned, yes. We ought to say, we ought to be in our Bibles and say, well, what does the Scripture say about this? Now, we know some of the things that are going on are very unscriptural. And why don't we just recognize that he, he knows the sparrows and he knows the hairs on my head And I'm just not going to fear. I'm going to trust. And I'm not going to go through life wringing my hands and stressing myself out. Do do you think God wants... You know what what I love about the birds? It doesn't matter if you come upon where they're at. They'll just fly over there and do the same thing they were doing. I mean, they're not, oh, my whole day is rude. You walked in my path. They just like, boop, they go over there, they're doing their thing over there. You know, Christian, remember, you are living in a spiritual realm. 
and no one can take your joy. They can't take it. You say, but you don't know what's going on. They can't take it. They can do all sorts of things on the exterior, but if you're losing your joy, remind yourself of this. No one but you can relinquish your joy that you can have in God. Paul said in prison, I joy, have joy, and joy forevermore. I mean, listen, Christian, let's get to the place to where we begin this new beginning and we go forward by faith, trusting in the Lord and living for the Lord Jesus this year. Let's do it. Let's just say, in the past is the past. I'm not going to be fearful what men can do unto me because I've got God. My whole trust is going to be into Him. And now let me say, fear, I'm not going to do it. I'm out. No more. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to stress about it. Because I am trusting the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you and we're mindful of your goodness. We thank you that, Lord, you see the sparrow when it falls. And we're thankful that no matter what happens to the sparrow, you see and know everything. You provide for the birds. You provide for them all the time. Lord, even the birds sing. They're out there rejoicing and singing and happy. But Lord, I ask, Lord, that you'd help us to learn this lesson. I ask, Lord, that you'd help us to learn how to trust in you and not be fearful of men, not be fearful of being forgotten, not be fearful of thinking or even believing that somehow our cares, our concerns are somehow not on your radar. Thank you that you could see everything. Lord, if you could count all the hairs on my head and give them a number, Lord, you know my heart too. And I ask, Lord, that you help us today. I'm wondering if there might be one that say, you know, preacher, to be honest with you, I'm not saved. I don't know that if I died today, I'd go to heaven, but I sure would like to know. There's never been a time and a place where I've come to know Jesus as my Savior. Preacher, I might be here today, and I might not know Jesus, but I sure would like to. Anyone say, preacher, would you help me? Would you pray for me? I'm not sure if I died, I go to heaven. I'm not sure I have Jesus in my life. Anyone like that? Say, preacher, just pray for me. And maybe you're a Christian here. You know the Lord. And maybe this idea of fear has struck a chord. Maybe God struck that chord in your heart and said, you know, we need to begin to trust God in all things and not be fearful of men being forgotten. And my cares I have, I just need to trust the Lord. How many of you say, preacher, that's me. God kind of spoke to me today and said, gave me a few things that I needed to do. Anyone like that? See that and that and that and that all over. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is working. Lord, I pray that you bless this invitation. Have your will and way. Thank you for one another. And Lord, thank you for the birds. And Lord, we're glad that we don't have to live in fear and that we can go through life and do what you've asked. Fear not. Help us to do that in our life. Bless this invitation, we pray in your name. Amen. Let's stand together, spirit of prayer. If God spoke to your heart, we have an altar here. We have your seat. Let's do business with the Lord today and ask Him to help us. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands. I lift up my hands to the Lord. Sing. Love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. I love you. Thank you for your kind attention to God's word today. We trust that it's a blessing to you. Listen, 
it is quite different uh, these times of connecting with one another and our heart's desire is if you're visiting with us today, we do love you and we care. We wish we could show you how much we desire to connect with you. And let us know. There's a connection card right in front of you. If you have any needs, any prayer requests, anything like that, we'd love to have you fill out one of these. And we'd love to have, connect with you. So let us know. Uh, whatever works for you, we want to connect with you. We want to show you that we care. We are a loving church family. God is doing some amazing things, changing lives. And having a church family is one of the most important things we could do, especially during these times and these moments. Okay? Mike, go ahead and uh, close our service in a word of prayer. Father, we come to you in, in prayer, thinking about the message that we've heard about fear and how we do fear the world. We fear the things that are going on around us. We fear what others may think about us, Lord, and we should be concerned about what you think about us. Lord, you've told us how valuable we are. You've told us how much you love us. You've told us what you will do for us how you care for us. Father, may we just trust you in all things. May you help us to get through each week, through this next week, thinking about you and wondering what you have in store for us. So, Father, may we look to your word. May we listen to the messages. May we honor you in what we do. Just guide us through this next week, Lord. Keep us safe. Help us to serve and honor you. And we ask that you bless us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.